As the Cold War heats up in the early 1950s, the growth of the Soviet Union's submarine fleet alarms American military analysts. At the height, they must have had 500 submarines in service. At the best, we have about 130 submarines in service, 150, some number like that. And the way that we make up for the lack of numbers is much better technology. We push the technology as hard as we can. American scientists' first great success is powering subs with nuclear reactors. Now, U.S. subs can stay under longer and range farther. Then, in the late 50s, they figure out how to fire ballistic missiles from subs. This gives the U.S. a huge advantage in the Cold War. A missile hidden in the deep ocean on a submarine is virtually unstoppable. But in short order, the Soviets are doing the same. The Navy responds with smaller, quieter attack subs that can track the Russian missile boats around the world. The goal, should war break out, to destroy the Soviet subs before their missiles are launched. American submarines are state-of-the-art, the weapon of weapons throughout the Cold War. But mistakes at the cutting edge are deadly. Well, most people don't realize how truly dangerous the deep sea is. Uh, it, it's, it's waiting there for you to make a mistake. When you make a deep dive, uh, you can feel squeaks and moans. You can see things start to pop, water starts to come out. I mean, it's, you're right on the edge. And if you make the slightest mistake when at the edge, it'll kill you. That was made painfully clear in 1963. The Navy's newest nuclear submarine, the Thresher, is launched at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. The 278-foot craft is the first of a new class of attack subs designed to operate deeper and more silently than previous undersea craft. The Thresher will have a crew... Thresher was the best of the best. It was this incredible piece of machinery that we put to sea, the first of a whole new class of submarines that were going to be super quiet and give us an enormous ad advantage over our communist foes. Now she, as we saw it anyway, and I was a little bit in at her beginning, she was really a leap forward. She was the killer shark, the first real killer. At the time, of course, I thought we couldn't get any better than this. We were going to be the, the big kids on the block from that time on. She had the first computerized uh, fire control system in a submarine. She had this big sonar, which had incredible range. She could fire anti-submarine missiles, which were a new thing then. She was the most advanced submarine we had devised. When pressure was introduced, we realized the significance of that moment. And we could only hope that our subs wouldn't be at too great a disadvantage. April 9th, 1963, Thresher heads to sea. Early the next morning, she begins a deep dive, as deep as she can go. It was near Corsair Canyon that they decided to make their dive. And they had a ship above, the Skylark, uh, they had an ASR. Now they call them rescue uh, ships, but certainly not for nuclear submarines. And, but it was able to have a line of communication, so there was a dialogue going on. Everything goes smoothly until 9.13 a.m. That's when Skylark gets the first hint of a problem down below. Thresher reports, experiencing minor difficulties, have positive up angle, am attempting to blow, will keep you informed. Three minutes later, there's a second transmission, garbled and unintelligible. It's followed by a low-frequency rumble. Then, silence. On the surface, there's no sign of trouble. But as the minutes pass, fear takes hold. 
Will the 129 men on board Thresher ever see sunlight again? Skylark reports Thresher's continuing silence to fleet headquarters. It's the first tragedy to strike the nuclear sub-force. It hits the tight-knit community hard. I immediately made an assumption that it had happened perhaps in shallow water. Uh, jumped in the car, drove over to the... Uh, develop excuse, me, excuse me, the development group headquarters went in to offer what help I could, could give, and they just said it was too deep. We'd lost 100 good friends. It's beginning to sink in. Uh, still difficult to believe. Uh, Ray McCool had left Thresher just moments before her departure because of a family emergency. In my mind, it was impossible uh, to lose a ship as fabulous as that. I couldn't think of any reason why, uh, why she was lost or why she went down. 129 men gone, all that machinery gone, all this cutting edge, you know, the beginning of this new wave of technology gone and we don't have any idea what went wrong. The very first thing they had to do was to find it. They had to understand as well as they could uh, what went wrong. They had to do the forensics, they had to do the, the detective work, and they couldn't even find the submarine. And that went on month after month after month. The Navy even brings a car out and studies how it sinks to the bottom hoping to discover some clue to the location of Thresher's remains. Remote cameras and sonar sounders are tirelessly dragged over the sea floor. And the Navy's only deep diving vessel, the Bathyscaphe Trieste, spends as much time searching the bottom as her crew can stand. Finally, after six months of searching, Trieste discovers what's left of the thresher. The sub imploded with such force, nothing remains but scrap metal. Meanwhile, a Navy Court of Inquiry is making discoveries of its own. Thresher's maintenance records show that 14% of the joints in the piping that moves high-pressure seawater through the boat had failed ultrasonic inspection. Hundreds of other joints had never been tested, even though pipe joints of this type on other subs had failed, causing serious flooding. At the depth Thresher was at when she was lost, failure in a six-inch pipe would dump 100,000 pounds of water per minute into the ship. Thresher's last telephone transmission gave the court vital clues as it painstakingly reconstructed what had most likely happened. A failure in an engine room pipe floods the compartment and blows enough fuses to force a reactor shutdown. On battery power alone, Thresher does not have enough power to reach the surface. Now normally when you're at depth like that, you drive your way out of problems. You just bow up and you just apply uh, power and you drive yourself up to, to your safer depths and get yourself out of trouble. As a last resort, they blow compressed air into the ballast tanks to displace water and gain buoyancy. But Thresher's ballast system is an old design, from the days when submarines couldn't dive this deep. And it couldn't get enough buoyancy. Remember, it's, getting, it's taking on water, so it's getting heavier, and then it's just going to go up, sort of stall out, and then just slip back. As Thresher sinks below 1,500 feet, her hull can no longer withstand the crushing pressure of the sea. And uh, once you go below crush depth, which isn't far away, then Mother Nature 
does it. Uh, pressure just, you know, crushes that submarine. Goes off like a bomb. Scattered fragments of twisted metal are all that remain of Thresher, the greatest submarine of her day. This footage was shot in the 1980s by Bob Ballard as part of a classified Navy effort to survey the debris. His cover story was his search for the Titanic. Coming in on, on the Thresher for the first time, it was... Uh, eerie. It was very much like going to a battlefield or going to Pearl Harbor. Something horrible happened here and a lot of people died and you've sensed that. 129 men, casualties of the Cold War. The Navy Court of Inquiry concludes that in trying to rush Thresher's exciting new technologies to sea, the Navy made mistakes in design and construction. The Navy vows it will never happen again. But five years later, in the spring of 1968, tragedy strikes once more. <laughs> 